So having heard some of the science, um, uh, we'll now move on to actually the more clinical ap application, which uh, it's nice to invite Nigel Hall, who's going to come and speak about the diagnosing, monitoring, and testing uh, for birdshot, all of which I'm sure patients in the audience will know um, what all that is about. But we'll try and summarize it for you um, with Nigel. Thanks very much, Nigel. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, thanks, Ria and Annie and all the organizers for uh, inviting me along to come and speak on this subject of uh, diagnosis and testing and monitoring. Um, so, uh, unlike uh, Doc Martin's little handheld device, <laughs> uh, we would tend to use, in patients who've got typical symptoms, and you can tell us more about that than probably we can, that, blurred vision, floaters, flashing lights, poor nighttime vision. Um, we like to look at the, in, the inside of the eye with the device on the right-hand side, which is called a slit lamp. And with that, we can see the inner lining of the eye, the retina with its blood vessels shown here, um, and the optic nerve, and also a darker patch in the center which is called the macula. Uh, and this, this shows us a side view of that same area in quite close up. And you can see that there's a dip in the center called the fovea, which I'll come on to talk about a bit later. Um, above that picture, above the colored part of the picture, there's the internal part of the eye, uh, which is known as the vitreous. And that's normally quite clear and colorless. Uh, you can see the retina itself, the macular part of it, has got a um, layered structure to it, and there's a kind of orange band halfway down, which is the junction between the retinal part and the choroid. And it's that lower part, the choroid, where the birdshot spots seem to appear. Now, as many of you know, the diagnosis of birdshot is quite commonly missed or delayed initially, and so it's almost miraculous <laughs> in my mind to see Doc Martin picking up the diagnosis within a few seconds of meeting the patient. And one of the reasons for that is that the, one of the common symptoms of floaters it is actually a normal experience, and most of us will have done this lying down on a a uh, sunny day looking up at the blue sky, you can see these little dots and squiggles, and those are just normal, tiny little opacities within the, the, within the clear jelly of the eye. Sometimes the floaters can be more dramatic, something like a spider or a cobweb might appear, and that's quite a, a normal, common, age-related phenomenon. But in birdshot, it's different, because What's happening there is that white blood cells, cells of the body's immune system that Graham's talked about, leak out of the blood vessels and they cast a tiny shadow on the retina moving around every time you move your eye. And you can see some of these blood cells illustrated here. They're the little fluffy balls which are uh, alongside the donut-shaped cells which are, which are red blood cells. This... This slide shows really the hallmark of birdshot, which are these creamy colored spots, um, which are said to be like the spread of shotgun pellets. And you can see that there is quite a wide variety of different appearances. Um, on the right-hand side, for example, you can see the spots are smaller, more clustered around the optic disc, uh, whereas on the left-hand side, they're, they're slightly larger and more widespread. So there is quite a wide variety um, and in some cases, the spots may not be there at all initially, um, and in other cases, they may seem to disappear after a while. I'm not really going to cover this particular topic because Graham's already done it. This is, this is the importance of the HLA A29 molecule. Um, only just to say that not uh, everybody exclusively comes back with a test positive for this, although the vast majority do. Um, and sometimes with the older style of testing, which uses an antibody-based technique, there may be inaccuracies there that can be corrected 
with more modern methods. So it may be worth asking your doctor about that. What we've what we've um, come to learn is that uh, visual acuity on its own is, is not enough. It's not the only thing that is going to affect our decision about diagnosis and treatment. It's perhaps a little like Andrew Lansley's vision of the NHS. <laughs> not always trusted to give you the whole picture. And this is another form of testing which is actually rather rarely used in clinical practice, um, and it's testing something called contrast sensitivity. It's often used as a research tool, and people with birdshot may notice that in spite of having relatively good visual acuity, they do rather poorly on this, this form of testing. In fact, with this screen, most of us should only be able to see about halfway down there, I suspect. This is another area that can be uh, more affected than you would expect, and that's the area of color vision. Um, in clinical practice, again, we tend to use these sort of charts, and you can see the number 74 there, hidden among the colored dots, or you may be able to see that. It's normally a test for color blindness, though, and for research purposes, there are more accurate ways of measuring color vision. To get a full picture of what's going on, we need to know something about the peripheral vision, the visual fields, uh, and this is the kind of instrument we use to do that, and it produces a printout similar to this, with the light uh, areas of gray showing areas of good vision, and the darker spots showing where the vision is impaired. Many of you will know about this technique, which is fluorescein angiography. Um, there are two dyes used, and the first, the first dye used, in, which is the fluorescein dye, tells us about how active the condition is and how much leakage there is from the retinal blood vessels. And these photographs show uh, retinal blood vessels which have got a slightly fuzzy edge to them. Uh, and what that means is that the inflammation seems to be active. Um, and that's useful because it tells us about the circulation in front of the retina, but we also need to know about what's going on in the layer behind it, which is called the choroid, and that requires a different dye, a, a green dye called ICG. And uh, here the inflammation that we see is shown up as a series of dark spots. Perhaps most important is uh, electrodiagnostic testing. Um, and this equipment here measures the retinous response to a flash of light. Um, and it produces, it produces an impulse when a flash of light hits the retina that can be detected on the skin. And this shows a gold electrode that's picking up that weak signal which can then be amplified. And it tells us um, whether the inflammation is, is currently active uh, what's the state of health of the retina? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? And it's very useful in order to make decisions about treatment. A few years ago, all we had was the, the yellow dye test, and people would frequently come back for uh, injections of fluorescein to find out what was happening with, uh, with their birdshot. But now we've got OCT, and that's really changed things. It's improved things a lot, because we can pick up conditions uh, like the one shown in the lower part of that picture, cystoid macular edema. That really can affect central vision quite badly. And the, the benefit of this is that we can measure it quite accurately and see from one visit to the next whether our treatment is working or not. So just to summarize things, the, um, the initial assessment is, is really to... Um, establish the diagnosis, and your ophthalmologist will probably want to wait for the HLA A29 blood test to come through before they can confirm that with you. Uh, then we'll want to have a look at what the state of things is currently, how much inflammation is going on, and um, what's the 
overall level of vision is before deciding on uh, initiating treatment. And then at subsequent monitoring visits, we'll use some or all of the tests I've mentioned in order to be able to see how well the treatment is doing. Um, and that's really the subject of the next talk. Thank you very much.